Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back to another edition of Real Conversations, where it's my privilege to sit down with Neil Howe, who is the founder of Sakelum Research and also an economist, a demographer, and a historian who's written one of the best books that I've ever read called The Fourth Turning. I read it in 1997, and I'm going to talk to Neil about this now. But Neil, if I, I, I actually have been quoting this most recently in my research, quoting your book, quoting some of your fantastic um, cyclical work and cycle work, and it's uncanny where we are today relative to how you've mapped that out. So first what I'd like to do for people who don't know who you are is just go through what the fourth turning is within the four different periods. Just explain your process. Yeah, and maybe to say that, you know, we didn't, fourth turning didn't arrive overnight, you know, <laughs> as a book. Uh, this was a, uh, one of several books that I wrote with uh, Bill Strauss. Uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, the first book, which came out in 1991, which is really the genesis of the, of the, the, the foundation for this whole approach to history, uh, which is called Generations, the History of America's Future. And that book took about three years to research, mm. full time for both of us. It was a wholly different way of telling, writing history. And we were amazed that no one had really done this before. We decided to write history a very different way. And being, you know, baby boomers, both of us, we, we thought we had some special uh, insight into generations. Right? You're the so, perfect age. Yeah, right, right. It was <laughs> our generation. Well, both of us realized that as boomers, we were growing older very differently than our parents of the GI generation, the World War II generation. You know, they came of age with D-Day. We came of age with Woodstock. I mean, just, just none of our sense of life seemed at all the same as our parents. And realized it wasn't just age. It was just everything about our values were different. Our mm -hmm. location and history, what had shaped us was different. And we wondered, had that ever happened before? We went back in American history and found, yes, these generational differences have been a constant throughout. In other words, these, these constant contrasts. So we went back and we told history according, according to what we called the generational diagonal, which is to tell the collective life story of an entire group their entire life story, you know, that has a certain location in history, which means they came of age, they childhood in a certain period, and they came of age in a subsequent period, came of age into adulthood. And so we, when we told history this way, we found that not only are generations very different, each generation very different from the next. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, one generation came of age during the war, the next generation were the children during that war, saw it completely differently, you know, drew completely different life lessons from that, right? And as they grow old, they, came, they grew old differently. And to write the history of America that way meant that you had, if you were going to write about Abraham Lincoln's generation, you'd have to know about, well, what was childhood like in the 1820s? What was courtship like in the 1880s and, and 18, uh, 1830s and 1840s? You know, who was founding all those Fourier communes? And what was the new feminism? And who was writing all that poetry? And, you know, <laughs> and then what were midlife people doing around the Civil War? And what was growing old like? Uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, or, or shortly after 1900. Well, the result was piecing together history in a very different way, right? And, and, and so it was enormously difficult to undertake. It took mm -hmm. us a long time to do. And it was really that process that not only told us that generations are very different, but that different generations tend to arrive in certain patterns. They don't, they aren't just different randomly. Mm -hmm. Certain generations always tend to follow other generations. Right? And when you say patterns, it's, it's interesting that you came to this conclusion before, and what I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but behavioral patterns. You know, there's a, a big behavioral right. component to what you call a certain pattern of life. You, you make the analogy or the analog to the four seasons. So right. this was written well before Dan Kahneman came, well before some of the more popular behavioral economists, per se. So it seems like right now, at least in my life cycle, and I'm a 13th gen or an X gen, I'm just <laughs> right. not a boomer and I'm not a millennial. Right. I just employ millennials, but that's where I'm at. When I read this and I have that, that component of behavioral psych in markets, it, to me that's what makes it so appropriate. Now, if you're right and we're in the fourth turning, so can you explain yep. what that is in, in, the four pat in the four patterns and stages? Well, yeah. and, and what we what we what we saw is that these these generational differences were related to to huge uh, cycles or or shifts that people had already mm -hmm. identified uh, cycles of uh, of uh, political realignment 
long cycles of, of economic growth, um, cycles of even things like you know drug abuse, cycles mm -hmm. of crime, cycles of, I mean, you could go on. I mean, all of these various cycles. What we found is that no one had talked about these, these rhythms of history. They identified them all, uh, but, and they, they identified their rhythm, but they never really identified what gives them a certain periodicity. Mm -hmm. They never really contextualized. Well, exactly. But if you have like a war cycle, we, you know, Toynbee came up with a famous war cycle. It's every 80, 80 or 90 years, we have a huge major war. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in all of the, all of the sort of modern periods of American history, even in the, in the, in the ancient world, you know, where you had many different powers contending. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, it's interesting, though, people rarely ask, well, why 90? Why not a 900-year cycle? Why not a why not a nine-month cycle? Right. Mm -hmm. In other words, why do they? Why do these period? Why do this periodicity? We think the periodicity is related to the length of the human life cycle. Yeah. You know, generations are born, they age, they flourish, they pass on, new generations, and this is what governs these cycles. So we thought we had a master idea of what these rhythms are, and it gave rise to this idea of turnings. And each turning is like a season. If, if you consider a generation lasting about you know, 20 or 22 years, something like that, about the length of time between being born and coming of age as an mm -hmm. adult, it means that a total series of four cycles is going to last about the length of a long human life. It's right. going to be you know, 80 or 90 years. And, uh, and each generation coming of age or being born or arriving to power is associated with a new turning, a mm -hmm. new season. Uh, and we identified these. Uh, the first turning, uh, well, a good example of that is the, the post-World War II American high. You know, you think of the presidencies of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy. And this is almost always a period in all of the societies we study. And this isn't, by the way, just American history. We've looked mm -hmm. at other modern societies as well. These post-crisis eras, assuming the crisis doesn't end catastrophically, are generally periods of social solidarity. Institutions are strong. Individualism is weak. Uh, society as a whole knows where it's going. Uh, so it feels like it's greater than the sum of its parts. You know, it's mm -hmm. greater collectively than the individuals that comprise it. It sounds like America uh, today. It, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly what it doesn't sound like, does it? But this was the way America felt you yeah. know, back in the 50s, early 60s. Um, and uh, and to today, like to just kind of speed that up, just because people watching this have yeah. the attention span of not the GI generation. Right. Uh, you, you have the GI generation, we have baby boomers, we have my generation, right. X-gen, whatever you want to call us, mutts, uh, and then you have millennials, and, and, have millennials. and we're in, you, you call the fourth turning a crisis. Well, it's a crisis, and, and, and it's, a, it's the winter season. I mean, it's the, it's the season that comes right before the first turning. Maybe that's why I like it. It's like kind of I mean, Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Well, Game of Thrones, you know, that's actually <laughs> another interesting question because a lot of people have remarked to me that a lot of those, the words actually were... Well, I, by the way, I see in well, a lot... Was, he was writing the books, actually, right about the time that Fourth Turning there is out. There's an uncanny, <laughs> uncanny similarity, not only between his work, and I don't mean this for people who are watching this, for this to come off the wrong way, not that I'd call you out or anything, but there are people who talk about social mood right. in our business. I mean, this is right out of the Fourth Turning with no citation. I mean, this is basically what you're talking about. Right. You're talking about the behavioral change within generations. And here we are today, we're in the fourth turning, and this crisis, um, you talk about it having two points. It having its you know, initial period or crisis, and then you well, have it the has, climax. It, it, has its, it has its catalyst. Catalyst Every crisis has its catalyst, and, and that would have been the 2008 market crash. Right. That was 1929 in the case of, obviously, the Great Depression, World War II. It was the firing on Fort Sumter in the case of this. I mean, you can go back yep. and see these. And what I love about your work is, to your point, it goes across British, French, U.S. You right. just didn't give enough airtime to the Canadians, by the way. So, well, uh, you know, there's I, I it's always, not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They're, they're so close to us anyway. So. Uh, but we went through our catalyst. and We went through our catalyst. And what we haven't achieved yet is the second stage, which is the regeneracy. That's when the sense of emergency becomes bad enough that people feel coalesced to cohere and to begin to uh, band around a new so source of social trust. A lot of people thought that might happen with President Obama. That hasn't happened. The, po the country remains as polarized as ever. Uh, neither side seems to have an advantage now. 
This is actually a rather unusual kind of lengthy period before a, a, the regeneracy. Well, it's kind of like a head fake. You know, if you really Political. think of Obama almost played front ran right. the entire, like what they would want, a regeneracy or a social trust. Right. The you know, transparency, accountability, trust platform of his first election. It got a lot of millenniums. It got a lot of people in my generation to actually vote for him. Well, and, and, and there was a period, uh, as you remember, probably the the winter and spring of 2009 when the country was really afraid. Right. Uh, he had both houses of Congress. Uh, he had enormous uh, public approval ratings. And he mm. could have gotten anything through Congress that he wanted. Mm -hmm. And if I were to say there would be any, I don't know whether the president regrets this or, or whether uh, maybe some of advisors do, but you remember that famous Rahm Emanuel quote, right? A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> and at that time, he could have solved any of America's long-term problems. You know, I don't care, you talk about entitlements, you talk about infrastructure, you, got, you know, whatever he wants, he could have gotten. But if he did, he would have screwed up your whole framework. He would have been too early. He would have been too early. In solving, yeah. you know, again, he, first you have to have the catalyst, then you have to have the well, climax. Well, you, you have to have the regeneration. So now so, he's been perfect for your narrative. He is going to perpetuate the climax. <laughs> Well, then the regeneracy leads to the climax, and the climax is the do-or-die moment. And that's the moment of great danger. It's the time when the risk of total war is, is uh, maximized. We fought all of America's total wars in fourth turnings. Uh, all of them? Well, all the major ones, yeah. The, the, yeah. Well, all the total wars. I mean, uh, you know, World War II, the Civil War, the American yeah. Revolution, the no, World Unlike Spanish most succession. people that I talk to that will just spew about this stuff, you've actually done the work. I mean, I, I actually will take your word for it on that. Now, now, other things that's interesting. So the second turning is the awakening, and that's when people are rediscovering values. That was mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s. That's when boomers are coming of age. Mm -hmm. The third turning was what we call an unraveling, and that unravelings follow awakenings just like uh, first turnings follow the crisis, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, unraveling is the opposite of the first turning. Yep. Individuals, individualism flourishes, in, institutions are, are weak and discredited. I mean, you go into a bookstore today, uh, you know, every, every positive book in a bookstore you go into today is about me, myself, and I. You know, I'm great, I'm wonderful. <laughs> All the downbeat books are about things we share collectively. Well, every, end of yeah, society, right. end of politics, end of family, end of, right? 99% of things I complain about have to do with central planning. Of course. Or, or just or groups of people. Yeah. But you alone, or maybe just you and your little... Your little hood, your little your peeps, your, your little <laughs> own little group, you know, your tribe. Yeah, you're great. You're invincible. Yeah, yeah we're we're so we're all that. That that's the kind of that's a very fragmented society. These have always been decades of of, of bad manners, uh, low civic trust, um, uh, and I have you know, like, like the 1990s, uh, like which is really the beginning of this era, like the 1920s, like the 1850s. We've been there before. Anyway, on the basis of all this, we foresaw that there would be, because every generation was going to go, move into a new phase of life and begin redefining a new phase of life in the middle OOs. Mm -hmm. Boomers were going to start retiring. Gen Xers were going to start rising to posts of midlife leadership. Mm -hmm. Obama probably is the most notable. Obama, I define as a first wave Xer, born mm -hmm. in 1961. All of the all of the iconic leaders of Generation X are born in the early 60s, 61 through 63. It's fascinating. And, and, and then you get, uh, I'm later in his generation. Right. And you'll see a lot of people who are later in his generation who just say he doesn't represent the generation the way that he represented that he was going to represent the generation. So is that the turning within the turning? Well, he does. I mean, one thing I will say about Obama, first of all, he defines himself absolutely as a post-boomer leader. He says this constantly yep. in his speeches and his, in his biography. There's a lot of votes there. He said, they are the, they are the, you know, they were the generation of Moses, we're the generation of Jericho. Yeah, he goes, he's a, he waxes biblical on this. Yeah. Well, and that's the art of storytelling, it, isn't but it? But it's not just that. It's <laughs> that you look at his life story, okay? Yeah. He True. was the child of divorce. He was the child of a completely uh, dislocated child. You know, I mean, he grew up all over the world. He, you know, he, he was, he, he was, he was a, um, a, a disoriented childhood, mm -hmm. and that's very much the Gen X story. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and he represents too the shift a little bit from rock and roll to hip hop. I mean, he does the Jay Z moves. He gets the diss off the shoulder. He does this thing. <laughs> You know, I mean, he, no, the he nux. Right, he he's got the nuts. <laughs> yeah. so, but, but in other words, he does represent that shift. Yeah. And uh, uh, a, a Gen Xer, by definition, 
has no real memory of the American high mm. because they have no memory. I, I tell a good test of a Gen Xer is do you remember John Kennedy's assassination? Right. Uh, a late wave boomer will, you know, you, if you would, you know, I don't know, ask Madonna or if you would have yep. asked Michael Jackson or some of those people point. born at the end. But, but, but Xers don't. Well, we're so um, hostage to ourselves, to, and particularly in the moment where we're so selfish. And you're saying, you know, as, you know, within the fourth turning, we are uniquely selfish, and that's cyclically so. Well, we are, we are selfish, but we also, what is, what is new about the fourth turning, we're also selfish in the third turning. Everyone's thinking about themselves. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was, it was the 1990s when, when Gen Xer lang lingo kind of took over America, yeah. and we, you know, things like, uh, you know, it's up to you, you know, just do it. It mm. works for me. That's my favorite Gen X. Yeah. It works for me. I really don't care if it works for you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of the attitude yeah. we expect from yeah. Gen X. They became a generation of free agents. And by the way, the first wave of Generation X, born in the 1960s, uh, suffering through that dislocation, hating boomers just ahead of them, mm -hmm. and coming of age with Reagan is an unusually conservative group politically. Yeah. And we've noticed that in every election. And by the way, it is no accident that going into 2016, take a look at the, 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 the benches of each political party. So look at all the people now coming, just coming of leadership age, You're born in the 1960s on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. They're just too many to count. Think of all the governors, the senators. I mean, yeah. they're just, think of the prime time uh, capable uh, bench. It's at least 12 or 14 people long. Right? But in your book, I mean, but, you, look, you, you, but you, look, but look at the Democratic side. So you got Hillary Clinton, and she might be, you know, she might be rivaled on the left by by um, right. you know Elizabeth Warren, who's about the same age. Yeah. But my point is, you got all those people. Even if Rahm Emanuel runs, who's born in the late uh, 50s, or or Andrew Cuomo, or any of those guys, none of them are experts. So you're, you're I'm saying that on the on the old. Republican side. They are younger. all Xers. I will but, but they're I will not young this. relative to, like, in, if, to get to the fir first turning, you've, you've identified this multiple times. I mean, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt, right. uh, JFK, you, they're young 40-year-old presidents. Right. Forget 50 or young 60-year-olds or whatever they want to call themselves young anymore. To get to where this country needs to be, would you predict that that's the way it's going to start to get good again? Well, yeah, I think it's much easier to, to have a regeneracy around a young leader than an old leader, although I must say our history is filled with both. Mm. Um, uh, we've had plenty, you know, FDR was not a young leader. Right. Uh, he, he, he was not particularly old when he was first elected, but then again, he was in the White House mm -hmm. forever. <laughs> he, yeah. he aged enough. But, but my point is this, it's really interesting that there's gonna be a generational reversal. You remember when, when McCain ran against Obama in 2008, McCain was so much older. Yep. And what I'm saying in 2016, there's going to be total reversal. You're going to have an older, almost certainly an older boomer candidate, almost certainly running against a much younger Gen X candidate who probably will have an immigrant background. Mm. And I just think that's going to, it's, going to, it's really going to reverse the polarity of the race in some interesting ways. Mm -hmm. and, but it also gets to my point that in that birth year area of the 60s, which are just the people now arriving at leadership age, they're just so disproportionately Republican. That's, that was my point. Yep. You just don't find people in that age, Brian. I, you know, okay, maybe the governor of Maryland, you know, O'Malley, you, you look at a few of these people, there are around, but they're, 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 they're such a shorter list. Would you say that the aggregate comment, because what I said in return was that they're really not that young, even though you're saying Republicans are younger than Democrats, uh, relative to the real first-turning leadership uh, roles or role models that you've had in the country, do you think that to have the climax in the fourth turning, now that we've already had the catalyst 2008, you need the boomers to win and screw it up one more time? I think they've, they've planted plenty of seeds for screw-up already. I don't, I don't think we need to do... I think there's so much waiting to happen given the... the, the things that have yet to drop on the economy. Um, you know, we've had, I don't know how long we've had ZERP in place. Okay, this is historically completely unprecedented. I don't mm -hmm. think no one really understands what's that done to the economy in terms of setting, up, setting us up for disequilibrium. But, but I'll tell you something. Disequilibrium, you mean, I mean, you wrote a great article in Forbes about median incomes. ZERP creates inflation. It doesn't create real ZERP, wages. What ZERP did was preserve the wealth of those that already had it, 
And it basically means that young people will get no rate of return on new savings that they put mm -hmm. into the system. And it also means that millennials going out there, buying into the system or buying stock, yeah. are buying it at exorbitant prices. Yeah, if you I were a, a millennial, I'd love a stock market drop. This, so um, this, you had a great quote on this, and I just need to like read this one verbatim, because this was a beauty. The stock market has become an instrument of policy by absolute design. People are, are being almost forced into investing in equities because the Fed is deliberately making every other option unprofitable. This current rally has a, a hothouse quality to it. Yeah. It's like a beautiful orchid growing in the middle of winter. Well, exactly. And then, then the people then turn around and they say, do you know the, the, uh, the, the uh, Consumer Confidence Index has the stock market as a measure of confidence? In other words, <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest measures of a leading indicator is the stock market, which actually goes into the calculations as a, right. as a leading indicator. But the, but the indicator itself has now become an instrument of policy. Right. So the, the Fed is deliberately playing with the very indicator that it uses to predict the future of the economy. Now it's that, very bass backwards, it, we would say. Right. But here's, here, I want to make this, this point, because I think this, this, this is important for investors, and that is that in a context of sharply rising interest rates, that's one foot to drop, mm -hmm. right? Which is going to obviously have, have uh, negative, negative consequences. The other is uh, completely independently this problem of corporate earnings as a share of national income. I've been following this now, and it keeps going up every week. We have long surpassed the uh, historically unprecedented high that existed in 1929. We are now completely uncharted territory in terms of corporate profits as a share of national income. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's way up there. And if uh, that, every single chart you look at almost has the most asymmetry in world history. Well, exactly, but my point is if it simply reverts, and, and all the economists used to say, uh, and this was, uh, you know, in, back in the 1950s, this was considered, uh, uh, you know, just the, the common wisdom it reverts to mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, 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 it, the factors of income should remain constant over time. If it reverts to mean, if it even goes back just to what it was in 2003 or 2004, uh, and, and the PE ratios of the S&P don't change, we're talking about a, a 30 or 40% drop in the market right there. And the another thing that's gonna change is is you're going to have a complete unwinding of the whole carry trade, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is a lot of what's keeping China going. I think it's a lot of what's keeping a lot of the emerging markets going. I think, in other words, you have a tremendous amount of, <laughs> of what is now keeping just above stall speed economy going, mm -hmm. right? And that's going to end. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you, if, if you look out on, on, on our floor, you can see it out there right now, all these young people don't believe that they should invest in the stock market. Now, maybe that's because I've droned them into believing you know, some version of that. Uh, but the reality is that they don't fundamentally believe, these are millennials and 13 geners, and we do have boomers on the floor believe it too, but they don't fundamentally believe that they have to keep asset prices at all-time highs forever. To your point, they would much rather see them go on sale for once. It's interesting. We, we've done actually a lot of work on, uh, you know, generational attitudes toward investing. You're absolutely right. I mean, millennials now are the, have the most conservative portfolio selection of any age bracket under age 65 yep. right now. Uh, the only way to get millennials is to say something up to And you just wrote a book on millennials. Uh, most we, recently, like many you, books on millennials, yeah. but most recently a book in 2010 called Millennials in the Workplace. Exactly. So we do a lot of workplace training for, mm -hmm. for boomers and Xers trying to onboard these, onboard these kids. But one, one thing that, that we've seen is that there's only one way to get millennials to invest in, the, in, in, in stocks and in equities, which says something about how much they trust experts. You know, they really do trust, <laughs> you know. And that is to, ha to have them park their funds in like a target date fund. In other words, if they wow. feel there's a formula that kind of plans ahead their whole life, then they'll put it in these funds. Target date funds are now just taking off. Oh, they're just up. ripping. And yeah. millennials really believe in that. They think, oh, wow, that's my number. It's like, you know, <laughs> 2049 yeah, that's the you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> so they put, they put it in there, and they think, oh, they got this formula. It does it all automatically. That's really cool. <laughs> and, of course, these formulas automatically. It's like Bitcoin. Come. It was a formula. That was cool until it collapsed. Yeah, that's, yeah but the, that's it's, cool. your point is it's a, it's a so, pattern of behavior. It, it's, but, but it's also says something that millennials, and this is something, so many things that people don't understand about millennials, and one is they actually trust big institutions more than older people. Hmm. And, you know, 
everyone's trust in media, Congress, and presidency have gone down, but millennials is actually about 50% higher than boomers. Wow. And, and the reason I say that is because it was a reversal. When I came of age, um, boomers were the least, young people were the least trusting, right, of government and big institutions. Now they're the most trusting. And I think what's most interesting about millennials today, and this is one pattern we notice in fourth turnings, and it will have a huge influence on the following first turning, is that millennials, just like the young GI generation back in the 30s and early 40s, they want, um, they want to move to the center. They want to move to commonality. They want consensus. They don't like polarization. They don't like, they don't like to see people shouting at each other on mm -hmm. talk, ra you know, talk TV and, and talk radio. Uh, and I see that everywhere you talk to, mm -hmm. to, to, to millennials. They want comedy, even if it means suppressing individual. Yeah. It's amazing to watch because if you like, they they're fundamentally they hate confrontation. Yeah, and and, and they hate again. confrontation on on topics that they don't think are topics. So if you look at any of these, you know, just pick a channel uh, that's polarizing politically. Ratings are collapsing. You know, if you look at the CNBCs, right. MSNBCs of the world, not to name names, but you know, even on Fox on the other side, yeah. they don't want a millennials and thirteen. Gens or Gen X, they don't want to argue about race, gender. I mean, hello, these are not issues for our generation. But even where millennials do think it's an important issue, they don't like getting angry. Yeah. And I, uh, back in 2008, when Obama and Clinton were both in the primary, you remember, and it, I, used, I went out and toured campuses a lot to see where millennials were voting. This is kind of the first big election they were going to vote in, right? Yeah. And, uh, oh, they, they had a huge impact. It was amazing, though is that although they were almost identical on the issues, almost I couldn't find hardly anyone who was really all that in favor of, of Hillary. Mm -hmm. right? They were all in favor of Barack. And when I asked them and kind of got beneath that, uh, Hillary Clinton reminded them all of their boomer moms. She was just so passionate. She was all about her intentions. And Barack Obama was kind of cool and analytical, right? And they really liked that quality. That's a very interesting um, observation. They, they liked that. They liked that standoffish, analytical quality. And, mm -hmm. and the idea of someone wearing their passions on their sleeve, and that's, again, the kind of, you know, MSNBC and Fox News and all, right? That's what we think of, those, those, those hot talking heads, right? Uh, we, we used to do Nielsen ratings, uh, you know, back when I used to work at, you know, for, did a lot of work for Turner and, and Time Warner. And uh, I found that you could almost count on one hand the number of millennials that actually watch those stations, right? <laughs> uh, they don't. They don't. Well, the patterns are just amazing to observe. And if you can contextualize them like, like you've ha had the ability to over the years, I think it tr provides a great framework for people to start, particularly if they're trying to manage risk or think about cycles manage money in markets. I think it applies to a lot of things. So congratulations on getting into the institutional research business. And, uh, Thank you. And also thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Great. Thanks. It was great. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening in. He's Neil Howe. I'm Keith McCullough. If you want to read The Fourth Turning, I highly suggest it. Again, at Keith McCullough is my Twitter handle. You can find me there.